Hi, thanks for coming to our long oral presentation on understanding and visualizing generalization in units. My name is Abhi Rajagopal, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at UCSF in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging. This is joint work with Vamshi Chowdhury, Peter Larson, and Tom Hope. So without further ado, we are all aware of the potential success, but also the pitfalls of deep learning in healthcare. Central to these issues is the question of model generalization. While it's often the case that we have validation data to evaluate our models, we often want to know if our model will perform well in the wild or in the clinic. Understanding the features of networks that drive generalization can help us not only design better networks, but help us predict the limitations of deep learning in critical applications. The recent PGDL competition at NeurIMPS attempted to sprout research in this area by providing a large open source data set of some 550 CNN models trained on various image classification problems with variations of different hyperparameters, such as the number of layers, the loss function, and the learning rate. So for example, in this competition, you're given access to the training data set, model architecture and weights, and the goal is to predict a scalar called a complexity measure that correlates well with the test set accuracy. In the competition, this was evaluated pairwise between models, but in our work, we look at correlation over the whole population of models because we're interested in model agnostic measures. In line with the results from the PGDL workshop, we find that clustering and mix-up strategies also work well over a large number of models and datasets, even at the population level. However, we believe that the PGDL setup leaves open two questions. First is the question of how this translates to high dimensional data, such as medical imagery, which are severely data constrained or balanced. And second is how this can be applied to more exotic architectures, such as image to image models commonly used in AI driven radiology. So in this paper, we try to investigate both. First, we evaluate measures of regularity or network stability through a measure we call roughness. We use a special representation that makes this comp computation quick and tractable, even for very large 3D networks and data. Using the same representation, we can also efficiently compute data locality through a measure we call confidence. One of our contributions to this topic is to better conform to the layers or stages of the network, which turns out to yield a very efficient representation. When we talk about feature representations in CNNs, we often think of filter and activation heat maps. From a vision point of view, we often think in stages, but from a theory point of view, we see that we're taking a pretty high dimensional image and we project it over and over again until we get a final classification. So the question we ask is, what do these distributions tell us about a model's generalization? Typically, the intermediate features are still very high dimensional, so there are fewer filters than we need to form a basis, let's say, in a linear layer. But can we use this representation to infer model robustness just using the activation images themselves? So what feature visualization tells us is that we can look at the interior features of a CNN to evaluate metrics of generalization. So if we pass in an MRI into a CNN, we can extract not just the final prediction value or the logits, but also the intermediate feature vectors along the way. These are typically multi-channel tensors and you can compress them to visualize them and figure out what the network is looking at, something like the GradCam approach. But you can also use them to understand the features that the network is using to make decisions. So in this plot, I take a single input image and I pass it through a network and at each layer, we tap the features, perform PCA and visualize the feature space. So as you can see, the, the geometry of samples it can be very interesting. And in particular, we see that later in the network, these points representing images start to separate. So to get there, we typically compress the interior tensors into a lower dimensional space. The first reason for this is that it makes the data a lot more manageable and visualizable but from a practical point of view, it helps distance metrics make more sense. Now, of course, it's not strictly necessary to perform compression. You could simply use a transform, but we find that the representations of well-trained networks are fairly stable with respect to the locality measures across a various number of target dimensions. And really what we wanna do here is use these representations to build intuition. So for example, here's a figure from the winning solution to the PGDL comp comp competition by Natekar and Sharma, where they use clusterability of training data as a measure of model performance. So here, each dot corresponds to a different training image, and the colors correspond to their corresponding class label. And the idea is that in the representations of good models, uh, the features should be more se separable than the representations of bad models. 
because it means that networks that are good have not only figured out a good way to separate classes, but the classifier is actually smooth, which has implications on the function's regularity and thus the model's generalization properties. So in particular, if we, they use the davies boldeen clustering index, which looks at the inter and intra class distance between features of different classes. And we can compute this for every layer using the training data and labels, let's say, and you can see how this measure correlates with the test set accuracy of a given model. So here's an example where, as we expect, there's a nice separation of classes um, for, a good, uh, for a good model, but for a bad model, there's poor separation. And this is related, again, to the idea of data density and stability metrics I alluded to previously, in that we're basically measuring whether our approximation is oscillating heavily between samples or it's smooth, with the assumption that the smooth representations will have a better chance of generalizing to the whole domain. However, for, for high dimensional input images, such as 3D MRI, the feature images are prohibitively large. Not only is this challenging to sample and compress for the whole training data set, totaling tens of terabytes for even moderately sized data sets, but PCA or kernel PCA compression is known to be undesirable for images because the inputs are very high dimensional in ar an arbitrary configuration, and we usually don't have the right kernel to establish data locality. So for this reason, we try to think of something better and we realized that we could utilize the structure of a CNN to reduce the dimensionality of the features we consider. So for a conv layer, for example, we can look at the local receptive field, which just corresponds to the kernel size in this case. And what we're seeing here is that each output feature pixel or voxel is a function of the input feature patch at the previous layer. So this means that our PC, PCA based analysis can be restricted to a large sampling of these feature patches over the whole data set which are much lower dimensional. So if we look at how this works and we track which feature patches correspond to which output values, we can get a very different representation or visualization of the unit. So in this image, every dot corresponds to a feature patch extracted at each stage of the unit. And notice I said stage and not layer. And here the coloring corresponds to whether that patch coded for a prostate voxel uh, or not in the final segmentation map. So it's a little hard to see in 2D, but what we, what we find is that in good models, the prostate versus non-prostate feature patches effectively separate. You can see that you know, the red, red feature dots separate from the blue feature dots. Um, so this is cool because even for one image, we now have a way to evaluate clusterability using these point collections rather than the immediate feature images themselves. We can also evaluate the previously mentioned notions of stability and distance directly. For example, we can measure how far away each query images to the training set using all the feature patches that are extracted by a model. And as mentioned, to make this a bit more computationally tractable for large data sets and models, we train Gaussian mixture models on the feature representation of each layer, with, with no regards to which classes the features correspond to. So this basically gives us a nice data structure for evaluating map estimates or computing the confidence or locality of a given sample. It turns out our notions about locality in deep networks is sometimes horribly misguided. For example, if we, we restrict the operation of a CNN to look only at image patches, and for each patch we plot the distance to the training set, we see that for objects that are correctly classified by a model, the feature patches are actually far away from the training set. Or the feature patches corresponding to, it, to objects are actually far away from the training set. So here on the right, we're comparing the distance map um, computed at the final convolution final convolutional layer of a CNN trained on CIFAR-10 to what we might get using the standard GradCam approach. In many cases, the object saliency is much more closely predicted by the distance map. Using this representation, we can also compute the stability or roughness of a model around a query point. Normally, this can be very computationally expensive for common CNNs like VG VGG-16 or ResNet or UNet. Um, the details are in the paper, but the basic idea is that a quick and dirty way to compute the stability is by capturing transitions from clusters at layer L minus one um, to clusters in layer L. So in this paper, we evaluated these three different generalization metrics, clusterability, roughness, and confidence, or data locality, using a large data set of T2 weighted prostate MRI exams with corresponding 3D whole gland segmentations. Prostate segmentation is definitely an easy task, but that's good because we can easily train models to succeed at this task at various levels of performance, as measured using the intersection over union IOU score. 
The goal of our paper is then to, given a model and its weights, training data, training labels, and even some test data, but crucially without the test labels, predict a model that correlates with the test set accuracy. And in particular, we do that by averaging the scores from each stage of the 3D residual units we trained for this inference test. To jump to the chase, here are how these metrics correlate with the test set IOU accuracy. So here, each dot represents a model, where in each plot, the x-axis is a metric of generalization, and the y-axis is the average segmentation IOU on the test set. The top row here represents the original PCA-based analysis using the whole feature tensor as the feature vector, and the bottom row represents the same metrics using PCA on top of the local receptive field analysis that we introduced. As you can see, we can actually achieve quite a high Pearson correlation coefficient, as high as 0.88, using the confidence metric. But interestingly, this, this correlation is negative, so patches that are far away from the data set tend to be classified more correctly. This is an intricate point that will be explored in future work, but it's made obvious by the distance map results I showed earlier on slide 14. To gain a little more insight, we can also look at these metrics as a function of layer. So in this plot, each line again corresponds to a model. What we're looking for here is a nice striation in color something like a rainbow that you see here in the confidence plot using local receptive field analysis, which indicates that models can be ranked by the metric. One thing we didn't look at is the optimal weighting of each layer in the confidence metric, but it's likely any optimization in this vein using will require the use of calibration data, which will require an enhanced experimental setup that is outside the scope of this initial work. So in summary, we evaluated these three metrics of generalization that are based on notions of model regularity and stability in functional analysis, but with a very practical lens. In particular, we introduced a local receptive field analysis, which allows reducing the operation of convolutional stages to the size of the local receptive field, or convolutional kernel in the case of a single con flare, although the basic concept can be applied to any type of network or DNN. One of the major questions that was confirmed by this analysis is that our notions of data locality must be revisited. In particular, now with a high level of certainty, we believe that feature patches that are far away but crucially closest to the correct corresponding image label are indicative of good model performance. Thus, we require a mixture of both ground truth data, such as a small training or validation set, and testing data, for which we don't need any labels. This is a promising area for future work. Finally, I want to acknowledge my funding support with the NIH, NIBIB, and the NCI. Thank you for your attention.